Hello everyone, I'm Robin Pearson, and I'm here to show you what remains of the Church of the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. This is part two of our series on the Hagia Sophia. Today we take a guided tour around the ground floor of the building, exploring the sites that remain from the Byzantine era. The museum is so vast that we'll have to tackle the galleries and the mosaic decoration in separate videos. If you want to know more about the history of the building, then check out part one. The public entrance is on the western side of the building, which is the same entrance that the Byzantines would have used. These giant buttresses above the doorways were added in the 14th century to help prevent the outward movement of the walls. Stepping inside, we first come to the outer narthex. Most of the decoration here has been lost, and it's now used to house information boards for tourists. But before you move on, take a look at this sarcophagus made of verd antique. It's attributed to the Empress Irene, wife of John Komnenos. The sarcophagus was found outside a church which the imperial couple built, and was moved here in the 1950s. The reason for associating it with the Hagia Sophia is that John and Irene are immortalized in a mosaic up in the Southwest Gallery. Several of these impressive imperial sarcophagi have survived in various buildings across Istanbul. Stepping forward, we enter the inner narthex, where we can already glimpse the great interior of the church. But there's much to see before we go in. First, it's worth looking at the marble decoration which covers the walls. Eight different types of marble were used here and attached to the wall behind to provide a glamorous coating to the building's interior. In some cases, thin blocks of marble were cut in two, then opened like a book, so that the natural veining of the stone was duplicated, giving us these beautiful patterns. Like many features of the Hagia Sophia, this marble revetment would be imitated in other Byzantine churches across the centuries. At the south end of the inner narthex is an exit from the building, known to us as the Vestibule of the Warriors. In later centuries, the Emperor would enter from this direction and leave most of his bodyguard to wait for him here, hence the name Vestibule of the Warriors. The main draw here is one of the surviving mosaics, which we'll talk about in another video. But check out the elaborately carved doors while you're here. Supposedly, they were taken from a BC pagan temple in Tarsus, although some scholars think that they are a much later Byzantine work of art. Either way, it is striking, and we know it was installed here by the 9th century emperor Theophilus, because the monograms of his family have been carved into it along with the date. You'll also notice that the doors are now permanently open because the ground level outside has risen up over time. During a procession, the emperor would have made his way from here to the center of the inner narthex where he would have met the patriarch. The two men would then have entered the church through this doorway known as the imperial gate. Again, we see elaborate decoration which has survived the centuries. You can see crosses carved into the lintels, and just above the doorway, though it's quite hard to make out, is an image of a gospel book with a dove above it. It shows a quote from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 9. The Lord hath said, I am the door of the sheep. By me, if any man enter in, he shall go in and out and find pasture. You'll also notice hooks above the doorways. Curtains would have been hung in front of doors leading into the church, keeping the sacred space both accessible and hidden from the outside world. Let's go into the main body of the church, the nave. Here, the amazing height of the dome and the vast expanse of the interior become truly apparent. Even by modern standards, the space feels huge and impressive. Try to imagine the mind-blowing emotions a 6th century observer might have felt. Historian John Freely identifies this view as the best way to understand the genius of the building's architects. He points to the semi-domes as the key innovation that both lengthened the nave 
while allowing us to see the great dome even from the doorway itself. He contrasts this with St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, whose dome is higher and larger, but which can only be viewed when standing directly under it. By contrast, the Hagia Sophia's immense interior can be absorbed all at once and then appreciated from multiple angles. The nave itself is now fairly empty, if you ignore the scaffolding, compared to how it would have looked in Byzantine times. At the eastern end, we see the mimba or minbar on the right, where imams spoke from, and the mirab, the niche in the wall directing prayer towards Mecca. Uh, These enclosures are for chanters. During the Byzantine era, there would have been an array of religious furniture occupying this main space. We don't have time to discuss it all now, but thanks to these reconstructions from the Hellenic Cosmos Cultural Center in Athens, we get a sense of the altar, its screen, and the ambo from which the patriarch would lead the service. Around the nave are a beautiful collection of columns, which have been in place since the church was opened. Those holding up the north and south arches are made of verd antique, and seem to have been quarried from Thessaly specifically for the Hagia Sophia. In the corners of the nave, or to be more specific, the exedrae, the columns are made of porphyry, and they may be reused from another building, given that they are different heights to one another. The beautiful capitals show off the skills of 6th century Byzantine craftsmen as acanthus and palm leaf patterns spread across the stone. Each capital is marked by a monogram carrying the initials of Justinian and Theodora, as well as their titles Augusta and Vasilevs, although you need to understand the Greek lettering to decipher which is which. The columns are both visually pleasing and practical. They help support the weight of the structure, while also creating space to access the side aisles of the church. Helping to illuminate this space are the ubiquitous lights hanging down from the ceiling. The ones you see are electric, but they maintain the aesthetic from both the Muslim and Christian eras, when oil lamps were suspended from chains attached to the roof. Finally, on the nave floor, your eye will be drawn to this colourful pattern of small circles. It's a mosaic technique known as Opus Alexandrinum, using tiny pieces of coloured stone to create this effect. This was a later addition to the church. Our first reference to it comes shortly after 1200 AD, when witnesses record that the emperor's throne sat on this spot within a bronze enclosure. It's possible that this is where emperors were crowned by the patriarch during that period. Now let's move into the aisles, more shadowy than they would once have been. Many windows in the building have been closed up as part of efforts to maintain the structure's integrity. There are more columns here supporting the galleries above, the most famous of which is the Column of St. Gregory the Miracle Worker, which you can find in the northwest corner. Again, by 1200, this pillar had gained a reputation for healing the sick. Its bronze cladding was rubbed and kissed by those seeking cures, and as generation after generation kept this up, a hole developed which has now become a must-see spot in the museum. As you stick your finger in, you can sometimes feel moisture on the inside. This substance was thought to be able to heal afflictions of the eye and aid fertility. You can see the crowds lining up for their photo op. Throughout the history of the Hagia Sophia, different parts of the building were said to work miracles. Check out episode 168 of the History of Byzantium podcast to hear many of the tall tales told to tourists over the centuries. During major services, the emperor would sit in a special imperial loge, which was situated in the South Isle. We believe that the central bay is the most likely spot, and these divots in the ground may be connected to that structure. From here, the Vasilevs could absorb the service in peace, while also being available to take part during certain moments of the liturgy. That's it for our tour of the Byzantine ground floor. In our next video, we move upstairs 
to the galleries. If you'd like more detailed information about the Hagia Sophia, then visit thebyzantinelegacy.com. It's a fantastic website, providing breakdowns of the Byzantine buildings that can still be seen today, and there you'll find many of the still images and sketches used in these videos. If you'd like more information about the relics, myths, and legends of the Hagia Sophia, then check out these episodes of the History of Byzantium.